Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Premier Chats. Out of our deep respect for Indigenous peoples in Canada, we acknowledge that the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation is situated upon traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat peoples. We also acknowledge that the land covered by Treaty 13 is held by the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We also recognize the contributions and enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples in Ontario and the rest of Canada. We are grateful to work on this land. I am Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, as known as CPBF. We are a charitable organization and our mission is to empower families of premature babies, babies through support and education. This Premier Chat series is one of the many initiatives we have to bring information for NICU families and healthcare professionals. Here every Friday, we talk with experts, researchers, and parents who share with us their knowledge and experience. Also on our website, canadianpremies.org, parents will find all kinds of resources and support. And today we're going to talk about co-creating resources to support Indigenous families in the NICU and at home. In this chat, uh, let me just put this banner here. In this chat, Rachel uh, Pacione, we introduced the Marching Family Initiative, MFI, Early Years Approach to supporting Indigenous organizations through the co-creation of culturally adapted resources and trainings. Charlene Rattlesnake and Candice Cutworm from Muscoachee's Health Services, a partner organization of MFI, we speak to their experiences with preterm births, their roles in supporting children and families in their community, and the unique challenges and needs of Indigenous families in the NICU and at home post-discharge. We also launched a new resource and animated video that provides tips for Indigenous families on navigating the NICU. The video was created through a collaboration between CPBF, MFI Early Years, the Muscoachee's Health Services, and vCreate. And our first guest here today is Rachel Pachon. Let me bring her on the screen, joining us live from Montreal. She worked with MFI Early Years as the Learning and Engagement Facilitator. Rachel supports MFI Early Years partner organizations in developing culturally adapted resources and delivering trainings for Indigenous early learning professionals. Rachel holds, holds a master's degree in education and society from McGill University. She's passionate about working alongside Indigenous peoples to improve Canada's social systems, such as education and healthcare, in ways that will better support the needs and interests of Indigenous children and families. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm very excited for this chat and to share the new resources that we have. Yes, thank you, Fabiana. It's great to be here and to see you again. These resources have been a long time coming, so we're excited to share them as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about MFI and, and our organization and what we do um, in our supporting of Indigenous communities with uh, the resources and trainings. Um, yes, and second, like, just so everybody knows, uh, please do ask, send your questions and comments, and we're going to address them at the end of the presentation. Great. Um, so a little bit about the organization that I work for, about MFI. So it's a registered Canadian charity committed to improving education, health, and overall well-being outcomes for First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people in Canada. And we focus on a, on a flexible approach that can be adapted to best serve individual communities. Uh, and we're committed to supporting our partners and making this vision of the program a reality. So the focuses of MFI right now in their programming are early learning, literacy, entrepreneurship, and mentorship. And in the early years itself, where I've been working for the past year and a half in the curriculum and training team, the early years supports Indigenous innovation, resilience, and know-how by working with communities and organizations to co-develop programming that optimizes early child development. And the early years is an innovative evidence informed programming approach that seeks to honor parents as their children's first teachers, supporting healthy pregnancies and infancy and successful service navigation. 
and the earlier supports each community in building and enhancing services to best meet the needs of its children, youth, and families. So we have been working with a variety of communities across Canada, um, and we actually started out in Muscatese, Alberta with a partnership there. Um, so you'll, you'll hear from the lovely women, two of the lovely women from Muscatese in their, their part of the chat today. Um, but you can see from this map here where the earlier is, is currently partnering is uh, in Muscatese, Alberta. We also partner with the Yukon First Nations Education Directorate in, in Whitehorse and a number of rural communities in the Yukon. Uh, we also partner with um, an organization in Nunavut, Ila Taxinik, uh, where we're um, supporting programs in Rankin Inlet and Arviat. Uh, we recently began a partnership with Native Child and Family Services of Toronto. So this is an urban center that um, has started using uh, resources and adapting resources from the early years for their programming. Um, and we have a new program coming about in um, with a number of Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia with the organization Dajigamek. Uh, so the popularity of uh, the resources and, and training that we support with is has been growing and growing. We've had exponential growth over the past few years. Um, and this is of course very exciting as it means that we can be connected over the same issues across the country. Um, so I've been mentioning the resources that we have and to give some more details about them. We have the early years toolbox. Um, so the toolbox is kind of an integral part of, of the programming. It's an original resource developed by the early years. And the toolbox is a collection of cards that outline simple conversation topics, caregiving strategies, and playful learning activities that provide relevant information about early learning and care from conception uh, up to five years. So the accompanying early years toolbox guide, uh, which goes along with the toolbox cards, introduces additional information and supports for families and, and caregivers and ways that uh, offers more tips of how they can be supported in the home and in child care centers. Um, and we also have digital versions of the toolbox cards um, and the guide through our app and website. <clears throat> and the important part about the toolbox is that these cards don't stand alone. Um, they have resources that are attached to them. And those, so these resources are culturally adapted by each community. They could be language resources, they could be videos, they could be um, pamphlets of brochures, all different things. And each community will have resources that make the most sense for them that they share alongside the toolbox cards. Um, so I'll share, I'll show briefly what the Muscatee set of toolbox cards looks like. Um, so this, this set of toolbox cards was originally created to be used in home visits with families to highlight all the good things that caregivers are already doing uh, so that they'll continue to do them on purpose and encouraging them to expand on what they see their child doing. And the use of the toolbox cards has since been expanded to group gatherings and uh, for use in child care settings and preschool programming. Um, and the cards can be used in a variety of different contexts and the guide goes along with them to provide tips on how to use them. So in total, we have, as you see here, 164 cards and all different, uh, there's six different sections of the cards. So prenatal pregnancy and birth, language matters, nurturing care, starting to crawl, this is your family, um, and or sorry, starting to, um, meaningful moments, family well-being, and engaging environments. So those are our six sections. Um, I can speak a little bit about each one just briefly, and, and kind of how these come together as conversation starters for families. So the prenatal pregnancy and birth section has activities that support women as they prepare for the birth of their baby, and they the cards explain what can happen during pregnancy, what to expect with pregnancy and delivery and provide suggestions that will help their baby connect, that will help the mothers connect with their babies before and after birth. Um, in the language matter section, there's a focus on language and literacy development. So there's uh, certain activities such as suggesting ways for 
children to connect with their family using language and books uh, to support emerging skills like writing, sharing stories, playing with language, talking about their interests, and learning Indigenous languages. In the nurturing care section, there's a section around supporting children's social and emotional development, enhancing basic skills during daily routines, um, and encouraging ways to create a strong attachment between children and their caregivers. Uh, in the meaningful moments section, there's a lot of different suggestions for play-based activities um, and ways that caregivers can play or interact with their baby, strategies for noticing and encouraging children's interests, um, cognitive development, physical development, those kinds of things. Um, in the family well-being section, this offers more holistic look of the family and supports the life skills of, of caregivers and positive interactions with families. Um, so there's some topics around parenting styles, budgeting, um, connecting with the broader family and community and uh, preparing for, for changes such as going back to work or school as a parent uh, is, uh, is continuing with, with things after giving birth to their baby. Um, and in the engaging environment section, this is a newer section in our toolbox. This is a section that's based around um, encouraging children's cu curiosity and exploration by setting up spaces where they can learn and grow. Um, so some of these topics are around land-based play, the importance of displaying children's work and reflecting the community in the space. So these are, um, a number of cards that are used within programming. And um, we were very excited to partner with CPBF to uh, fill a gap in um, it within our cards. So within the prenatal pregnancy and birth section, um, we have been able, along with Fabiana and her, her team, um, created two new cards over the past few months that speak specifically to um, Indigenous families of premature babies. And so we've been working with the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation since 2021 to develop culturally adapted resources for Indigenous families with children born prematurely. So we have these now two cards that will be added to our um, the toolbox sets in, in for each of the partner organizations um, adapted in ways that make sense for each community. Um, but we have this card here in the NICU that can be used as a support along with resources um, to open up this conversation and talk about what it means to be there and kind of the, the challenges that, that parents could be facing at the time. Uh, these cards can be a way to open up that conversation with them and, and offer a bit of support in, in the feeling that you know they're not alone in this situation. So we have a card for in the NICU and, and we also have a card for caring for your premature baby uh, at home. So these are the two new toolbox cards that we're very proud to be adding to the prenatal pregnancy and birth section of our toolbox. Um, and um, we also have the guide, the toolbox guide content that goes along with this with a lot of extra information and the great resources that we are able to attach to them through the materials that uh, the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation has already produced and that we're working on together through our co-collaboration. Um, so just a word about how the toolbox is adapted. As you've seen, the uh, the earlier works in a number of different communities and supporting programming. Um, and the toolbox is adapted for each program. Um, so it's created in a way, it's designed in a way that is meant to be adaptable for a variety of child and family centered programming. And each community that we work with has a different version of the toolbox. So the adaptation process happens in a number of ways through the illustration process, um, which goes through a number of consultations with community members in order to land on illustrations that are most reflective of their community to, to provide that representation and, uh, and att um, attachment with seeing uh, oneself in the cards. And the toolbox cards are also vetted by community members to ensure that non-Indigenous child theory prevented, presented within the cards is applicable and that the cards are respectful of communities, knowledge, culture, and context. 
Uh, and the other element that we love about the cards is the translation piece. So with some of our communities, we've worked on adapting the toolbox to create uh, a fully translated versions or versions where at least a line or phrase on the cards is in the Indigenous language of the community so that there is that language piece in our resources as well. And you'll see here there is a uh, the Masquerade's cards, there's also our cards um, that were designed, um, that were co-designed with our communities in the Yukon, in, in Nunavut, uh, and in Toronto. So you'll see how the design varies considerably from one community to the next. For, um, in terms of the other training that I mentioned, um, a core part of what the earlier does is work with communities to create a training course um, called Understanding the Early Years. And Understanding the Early Years is a, a course that weaves together community-based expertise around birth and child rearing with non-Indigenous theory and healthy child development. And so the way that the course is put together is through a co-construction process, which is guided by consultation with Indigenous community members, non-Indigenous content is always vetted and adapted to make sure that it is meaningful for the community. And the content of the course is generated through interviews with Indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, and early learning professionals and community members. And this is interwoven throughout the course through discussions. The videos are, captured in partnership with the community-based organizations to make sure that learners see themselves and that their knowledge and culture is reflected in the materials. Um, and you'll see here that uh, this is an example of what a laid out manual for the course looks like. So we have online courses as well as the manuals for in-person um, trainings of the course. And you'll see here, so there's reference to a video of of an elder, as well as um, you can see that the the toolbox cards are highlighted. So we have we feature experts, we have um, conversation starters, discussion questions, and uh, a big part is the videography piece that um, creates the discussion and you know allows people to speak from their own lived experience as they reflect on what makes sense for them from their own experience and perspective. Um, and the two new toolbox cards created with the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation will be added into the course content um, and they'll be integrated as part of the resources for training for ind Indigenous early learning professionals. Um, and then the last piece that I wanted to mention is um, the Tree Network, which is um, a new website endeavor in the making. Uh, it's a project initiated by the early years to address the lack of culturally appropriate training and resources available to Indigenous early learning professionals in Canada. So the Tree Network is a space for delivering and accessing training, resources, professional development, and communities of practice, or what we call supportive circles, for Indigenous early learning professionals across Canada, as well as for non-Indigenous early learning professionals working with Indigenous children and their families. Uh, and MFI's version, vision for the Tree Network is to collaborate with partners and stakeholders to, to co-develop resources such as videos and booklets that connect with the core themes of the earliest toolbox so that they reflect Indigenous ways of knowing and being. And all the resources that are featured on the Tree Network will be uh, able to be accessed through a login. Um, and this will be, <coughs> sorry, this will be uh, made available for communities to access depending on where they're from uh, to protect the knowledge as needed um, so that communities have access in the, in the ways that they desire, um, as some communities want to keep their elders videos private, so we have that option, and some want these to be open and accessible for everyone. So in terms of these resources, um, they can be accessed through the, the early learning library on the Tree Network, uh, which I'll also show just a screenshot of here. Um, and in the early learning library, this is kind of like 
the hub of where all the resources live. Um, so it features resources around Indigenous child rearing knowledge and practices that connect with the toolbox cards that I showed before. And so, as I mentioned, these resources include videos, but they can also um, include videos, or sorry, they can also include lesson plans, handouts, um, brochures, many other um, formats too. And some of the resources featured have been developed by the early years and others are external resources around early learning and child development. And resources can be refined for your search. For example, uh, you can search by a toolbox section, by organization, um, by type of resource. And once logged in, members can access content specific to their community or organization, as well as content from other early years partners organizations that has made open and available. Um, so the resources created with CPBF, such as the animated video that you'll see later on in this chat, will also be featured on this library. And um, Fabian, I'll turn it back to you. Amazing. Rachel, thank you so much for sharing this incredible work MFI is doing across Canada. And I think the most important thing is to work with the communities it's not for the communities i think that is the most important lesson that we've learned to co-create uh, materials and education with the communities to really understand the needs and the gaps that are in the system so thank you so much for including cpbf in this work and now i'm going i'm very excited to introduce our next guest speaker but rachel don't disappear stay with us because we are going to uh chat with charlene together but let me just introduce charlene here she discuss some considerations when providing health services for indigenous families who have had premature babies the current role in a program that works with prenatal moms and the early years of a child's life the importance of culturally appropriate care why it's important to support Indigenous families in unique ways, need for an ICU awareness of Indigenous practices and beliefs, and she will touch on traditional methods that might be available to moms. So Charlene is right here with us. Let me bring her to the stream. Uh, Charlene Rattle Snake is of Salto descent. She's living and working in the Four Nation area of Muscogee. She's a mother of five adult children and grandmother of seven. She received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and late, ob later obtained a Master's in Community Health Nursing. Currently, she's working as a Family and Cultural Coordinator in the Early Years Program. She's passionate about Indigenous health and has worked her entire career of 16 years in the health field, helping Indigenous families strive for better health outcomes. Many of the moms that she encounters in the work that she does have uh, experiences with their families with preterm birth. She understands they might have unique challenges in obtaining health services for their newborns. Charlene firmly believes that a stronger connection to traditional values, beliefs, and teachings we improve health outcomes for indigenous people in Canada. Charlene, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm so honored to have you here sharing your uh, experience uh, working with the community. Good morning, thanks for the invitation. I'm super excited to be here too. And I'm more excited that um, different sectors are becoming more um, open to having like an indigenous lens into their programming. Absolutely. Charlene, tell, tell us a little bit about your community. Yeah, so I live and work uh, around the Muscogee community, which is about an hour south of the capital of Alberta, in central Alberta here. Um, <clears throat> on other either side of this community, there there's a nearby rural town about 15 minutes away um yeah our community is comprised of four separate nations um Ermanskin, samson louis bull and montana first nations and combined it's about 17,000 population and uh, we have a high birth rate well it varies from year to year but We've been anywhere between 150 to over 300 births a year. So I think last last year it was about 180 
So we do have a high birth rate. And as you know, Indigenous people are still, still have one of the highest birth rates in Canada compared to like one point whatever um, the average Indi uh, Canadian family is having. We're still having large families. So yeah, it's, and, and a good number of them, I think, are probably um, like preemie, preemie babies. Right. Absolutely. We know there is a higher incidence of preterm birth in the Indigenous community, so we do have a lot of work to do. Uh, Charlene, but tell us a little bit about your role as the Family and Culture Coordinator for this program. Yeah, like you said, I've uh, in my 16-year career, I've been mostly in the community health um, role, community health nursing role. But for the past three years, my role has been the family and cultural coordinator of the program here. And what I love about it, it is it's um, the flexibility of integrating cultural knowledge into programming. And um, my role is to connect the families in the program to the cultural resources in the community that not were not always accessible to to parents for a variety of reasons. One being the isolation, like even though there we're pretty close to the nearest city, isolation is a real issue mm -hmm. uh, when lots of people don't have transportation, um, and so. Another thing that I love about this is that it it's um, it's helping elders retake that role back of being the knowledge holders, the passers of knowledge, because a lot of the times they are isolated too. So when we bring them here and we ask them different questions, they're really open to sharing. So. Um, they have an opportunity to share the knowledge that they have with our families. Oh, that is incredible. Rachel, any question you have? Or I have a lot of questions here. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, Charlene, if you could just let us know more about your experience working as a nurse with uh, with pregnant moms or with Indigenous moms in general in, in the hospital and kind of what that has looked like for you. Well, I only did a, a short... Um, stint in the hospital but uh definitely definitely when i came to work in the community i did some work in the maternal child health program and what th that looks like is usually we'll visit the newborns uh, twice ideally so once the day after discharge and then about a week later just to make sure that feeding is going good um, mm -hmm. they're gaining the weight appropriately and if they're having any other concerns like we might have to do a newborn metabolic screen um, just the the normal things that any public health nurse would do off reserve and um, because of limited time we didn't really get to expand on that. We had like a checklist to do and make sure that we did all of this um, with the assessment piece. But then when I came over to this area, um, it was a little bit different because I was more free to kind of integrate the culture. Like, for example, um, Indigenous people in our area highly value the umbilicus so when it falls off we tend to put it away somewhere where we want the baby to have some skills in the in in his or her future whereas um, working just as a nurse we don't really have a lot of opportunities to share that knowledge so i really love the freedom and the flexibility that the that this program is opening for us Wow. Charlene, one question for you as a nurse, and you see these families in the community, for families who experience the ICU, that they lose some of those traditions because they are in such an intense hospital environment. When they come back to the community, when you see them, what do they share with you in terms of their experience? We're going to talk to Candice a little bit more about it, but I would like to hear from your perspective as a nurse, what you see. Well... The good thing is that when I was in the Matt Child program, I didn't see a lot of unhealthy babies or I didn't see a lot of babies that were born prematurely. There was the odd one and um, ch 
some of the challenges that I heard about was just like the, the lack of access that they had to any cultural resources. Like um, a common one that they do have access is most hospitals now have um, a cultural room and um, options to do smudging and stuff like that. But a lot of the the beliefs and practices surrounding babies aren't really integrated into the health system. Like um, the idea that a baby is a blessing, the idea that um, babies need um, indigenous names or spirit names, right? Early, early on. Um, and so, so some of those things are needed in, in hospital settings. And um, yeah, and I think there's a lot of room for preparing um, not only the healthcare staff, but also social workers that are supporting Indigenous families in, in hospitals. So I, I, that's actually my next question. How do you think the hospitals can better support Indigenous families? You mentioned a social worker, you mentioned some hospitals have a culture room or they are they have places to do the smudge ceremony uh, is this across the country as far as you know or this is some specific center yeah. how much more I, work do we well, need i can only speak to um what i know in in alberta here and i think it's pretty common now to have like indigenous workers in in every hospital um I know that one of the biggest issues or concerns is consistency of of um, of knowledge of those of those workers in those. So consistency of care is a huge one because there are some who are amazing and and they're huge supports to indigenous families in the hospitals. But then there are some that don't that aren't prepared at all. Um, uh, one example I can think of is I spoke to a social worker, brand new. She had only been in the hospital setting for a month, uh, pretty young. And um, she actually graduated from an Indigenous social work program and then started in a hospital, but she had, she, she didn't have a lot of knowledge with health related topics. Mm -hmm. So I think that people that are working in the hospitals, whether they're indigenous or not, need to be um, trained somehow. Like their orientations have to be, um, have to have a, a high content of indigenous health in it because we, st we, we know that indigenous people have a lot of health ch challenges mm -hmm. and um, it took, years generations to get us to the health state that we are now and it's not going to be a quick fix it's going to take right. a long time to um, regain the health that our ancestors had so um we i think that that piece is missing where not everybody that goes into those roles are trained equally so i think that every hospital or center needs to have a really good orientation piece that that um, looks at Indigenous clients. Shirley, it's one question because when Rachel was presenting, she showed different decks of cards for different communities and the variation in the in the content. So when you do a training, I'm just thinking if a hospital is in Ontario and another hospital is in Alberta or BC, though the training for the healthcare providers have to be different. So they provide the better care for the communities in their provinces or because different communities have different um, traditions or ceremonies. So how do that's, we... That's exactly correct. So all indigenous tribes, even within the province of Alberta, even within our four communities here in Muscogees, every single um, community is unique. And um, 
even it, it, it must be really diverse between provinces too. Um, and a lot of our traditions, values and teachings are surrounding the environment. Like, like behind me, I can see, oh, I just unplugged myself. Behind me, I see that I have a, a calendar mm -hmm. and um, every community or every nation is going to have different um, names for their moons. Like we have 13 moons and an example of one moon would be totally different from another moon in another community because mm -hmm. it's based on their environment. Mm -hmm. So one that has no trees is going to be very different from a community that is right by the ocean. So, um, so every community needs to have a unique um, way of orientating their their staff, nice. like hospital wise. Yeah. Okay. Um, my last question before we go into Candice, in your opinion, what are the most important things to improve the Indigenous health outcomes in Canada? You talk a little bit about you are not where your ancestors were, working towards that, you have a long ways to go, some key elements, and particularly for new families. Mm, I think the quality of care needs to improve. Um, some moms I hear are being discharged too early. For example, recently we had a young mom who, first time mom, 17 years old, um, and, and she was discharged within 24 hours. Um, to me, that's not acceptable. This this mom needs more support. Um, and then um, I talked to the Umbala, uh, I talked to the Umbalikas a little bit, and there was a hospital nurse that I know of that threw one away. And how is she supposed to know that that's something that's highly valued in our culture? So again, uh, just being having more cultural awareness opportunities for for hospital workers. Um, community health nurses in the community. There's uh, an ongoing issue all the time about systemic racism in, in, in healthcare facilities. And that's a real barrier to Indigenous people regaining healing. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it, we just need better a better consistency of care out there. And, um, and, and the schools of not only nursing, but schools of social work have to really, uh, they're getting better, um, constantly work with community members and, and um, reevaluate their programs and just how can we make this better to improve health outcomes for Indigenous people. Absolutely. And be open to learn. Right yes. to learn, yes. learn, ask questions. How can I can I make things better? What can I do better to support? I think that it always starts with the curiosity and willingness to support families. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to continue this conversation, Charlene. Don't leave us. We're going to introduce our last guest of the day, and she will be talking about her journey from prenatal to birth and the first two years of her son's preemie journey. Candace is from Ermskin Cree Nation, which is part of the four nations located in Masquachis, Alberta. Candace has been working with the Masquachis Health Services Early Years Program as an early years visitor since October 2019. Candace has three children, two girls, and a boy. Her son turned 11, old, 11 years old this year. He was born prematurely at 35 weeks and two days. He and Candace had many hospital stays during his first two years of life. And Candice is joining us live here today. Candice, thank you so much for joining us and for your willingness to share your story in your and your experience with us. I understand you have a very long hospital journey, and I would like you to ask like to ask you to share a little bit of that with us today. Yeah. Hi, I'm Candace Cutter. So, um, um, with my son being like premature, like, uh, um, my experience with him, like we did have a lot of hospital stays in the first two years. Um, my, during my prenatal journey, like my pregnancy up until 
he was born early. Like I had a really good pregnancy. I didn't have no issues. Um, my one of my last prenatal appointments, um, I was asked, and this was this is something that like I I wish that I had back then was somebody there with me to support me and help me advocate because um, my last prenatal appointment, um, the doctor had asked if I if I was okay with one of the practicing nurses to check um, the position of baby. And like at that time, I didn't know that was like, I didn't even know it was an option for me to, to say no to like somebody practice on, practicing on me. And while she was checking for like the, the position of baby, I, I feel like she, she was pressing too hard on my stomach because during that exam, I could feel bubbles coming up in my belly. And I think she had ruptured my water during that that exam um and i i didn't think anything of it it didn't concern me at the time but throughout the day i kept getting that sensation of like bubbles coming up in my my tummy and within 12 hours of that exam my water broke and i was 35 weeks and 35 weeks in one day and i waited to go into the hospital um with him and like I knew he was, it was too early for him to come because my body wasn't allowing that process of going into labor with him. I was not getting pains, like nothing. And I waited right until the 16 hour mark. They told me like they had to induce me at that point that there was like a chance of infection if I waited longer. So I, like even that, like I, I had to go through that to get induced so I could go into labor with him. And it didn't, I was in labor for a few hours and he was born, like knowing that he was, he was born too early. I still didn't, um, I didn't think about like all of the things that were to come after he was born. <laughs> um, so like, uh, when, after he was born, like even that like what charlene said about like being discharged too early like within 24 hours after my son was born um we were discharged but before we were discharged they had to do the heel poke on baby and the same thing i was asked by the, the nurses that if a practicing nurse could do the heel poke on my son and i said yes like yes she can do it and they, the new the practicing nurse had made a mistake and used an adult landslip on my son and he was a preemie and he just cried non-stop after that heel poke and like i was so like worried and concerned because he wouldn't stop crying like after that heel poke and i went straight to my family doctor at the time and like as soon as we got to the, my family doctor we took him out of his mouth bag and the whole bottom part of his foot was glass and he was already had like um his temperature was high and everything um and we went we went home and we got the results of his like heel poke and they said he had done this but he was still getting fevers and um, my doctor had explained to me that if they didn't if they use a regular like adult lens work on him that if it poked his bone that could cause infection and he was showing signs of infection three days after he was born and like he went back to the hospital and because he was like premature it was like it was really tough on him like he went through a lot of trauma like that was like our first time being in the hospital and he was only three days old um they could not find um his veins were too small um, they tried like every limb to try to get a um, IV going with him before we were uh, um, we were taken to the Stollery in Edmonton, the Children's Hospital in Edmonton. But because there was like so much, they couldn't get the IV on him, so that he got sent to the Stollery Hospital, and there they were able to get an IV, but they had to cut his hair on one side. And that was the only place they could get an IV on him. And 
um, our like our journey from the Casper Hospital right until we ended up at the Mary Nuns Hospital. We were in three different hospitals and three different triages. In this whole time, it took us like I think we were there for about maybe a total of 16 hours visiting every hospital where they could like find room for him. And even all of the treatments that he got, like he had a he had a spinal tap done on him. Um, they had to uh, do a catheter on him. And it, it, there are total, once we were admitted into the NICU, we were in there for 18 days. And um, like even that when we talk about like how there's not um, like cultural resources in the hospital, like I didn't have anybody there to like help me advocate for me and my son to like ask the questions that I wanted to. I just like I just went with everything that the nurses and doctors told me was going to happen. I didn't know that I that I I didn't have to put my son my son through a lot of that. Uh, Candice, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, every NICU story is so different, but I feel like as a premium mom, there's so many things that we can relate on the intensity and uh, the things that we don't know what to ask, how to ask, what, how much we can advocate for our babies. So I think my next question to you is, is like in, when you face all those challenges in the hospital, um, did you find there was extra challenges as being an indigenous mother in the NICU? And I, I know you're watching Charlene and the, and the before talking about what needs to be done in terms of cultural adaptation and respect of the traditions. I just want to hear from your perspective, how did you feel on that? Uh, but also I'm going to ask you to speak a little closer to your microphone because your audio is cutting off a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me any better. Yeah, it's a little better, but it's okay. We can still hear you. Okay. <laughs> so it was like the cultural part, like the support. I didn't find that there was like any cultural support. Like, mind you, this was 11 years ago now when we had all our stays in the hospital. Like, she said, like, they did have the cultural room, but that was not like. It, was, it wasn't something that I did, like the, the support, the cultural supports weren't in place until I came home from the hospital. Like I didn't have anybody to, to be there with me to answer any questions or to seek out any um, like traditional medicines and stuff that I could use for my baby. So like in, in the hospital, there, was, there wasn't much um, support when it comes to like cultural practices around babies. So how do you think we could help the healthcare system fill that gap? Because we know there's some, as Charlene said, the more willingness for people to learn and be open to it, but we still have long ways to go. From your perspective, being a mom who's here to hospitals for so long, what are your insights on that? I think I, like, like, since I started working like with the early years, I, I feel like I have an advantage with working with prenatal moms because I'm able to like encourage them and also have like open up conversations on like the like on the events like their babies born early. So just like being able to encourage families to ask those questions or even if they like to be able to advocate for themselves and their babies, like in the event that their baby is born premature. Right, Charlene, did you add anything to add to that? Yeah, I just thought of something that um, so um, traditionally families and relationships were always really important part 
of indigenous lives and we still are having um, really large families in fact yesterday mm -hmm. i just i was doing immunization clinic and i met a mom in the community um, who who had 11 children and so she was bringing her baby and so indigenous um, families sometimes have like their minds are like at home and they're still trying to to take care of their little one in the hospital. Mm -hmm. They might have uh, worries about who's taking their kids to school mm -hmm. or um, they might their family members might be taking shifts at, in, in their homes to take care of their families. And then just the process of meeting, like when you say that um, your, your baby was in the hospital for 18 days, does that mean like people at home didn't get the opportunity to meet the baby? So even have, establishing those connections right from the get-go would be really important for some families. Mm -hmm. Like um, how do they take turns coming into the hospital when there's only one person allowed? Is there opportunities for having like a, a family, um, not, I, I don't even like that word of family meeting. It's kind of make, maybe more of um, changing those words, like um, getting to know your family or something, a gathering mm -hmm. spe specifically for the baby. When they can't really leave the hospital, we can probably um, create opportunities for the use of the cultural room for families to come and meet the baby for the first time, things mm -hmm. like that. So um, there's a lot, there's a lot that can be done, but that's just one thing that popped out at me is how does the newborn meet their, their family, which is a, a hugely important, like even when you say extended family, we don't really have that term in our, mm -hmm. um, in our families, like our, our, there's no such thing like as a great aunt or um, there's no word for cousin. These are all close relatives of ours. It's either like a older sister or older brother. It's a sibling. There's no word for cousin. There's no word for like great grandmother. I mean, um, uh, like a great aunt, that's your grandma. It's mm. not like your grandma's sister or, or something like that it's it, families are really really close and all of those um, family members had traditional roles with um you hear the term it takes a community to raise a child and that's exactly what traditional communities looked like everybody was involved everybody had a role and mm -hmm. it's not just a, a nuclear family well, that is so important because we are we are doing so much work in the NICUs across Canada to have parental presence in the NICU because with the pandemic, they only had one or two parents and no extended families. I just learned something brand new right now. So thank you for that. And then who defines so the family? So this is a big conversation we always have with hospital uh, policymakers. Who defines so the families? Because family for me might be my husband, my mother, but everybody has a different uh, concept of family. And for indigenous families, this is such an important aspect to consider when you're creating those policies. That's why we everybody has to be at the table because we don't know each other's values and culture and traditions and all we have to be respected. So on that note, I'm very uh, happy to share the video that we co-create all of us here in this uh, stream today uh to support families adjusting to a new baby that i see i'm gonna play for uh, the video for a minute and the whole video is available on our website and i will also share the link let me just bring you the video here and then we can talk a little bit about this video after let's see if it's gonna play baby in the NICU. as a parent the NICU can feel overwhelming and intimidating as Indigenous parents, there are a lot of extra considerations and the stresses surrounding a NICU stay. Since you are the most important person in your baby's life, it's essential to take an active role in your baby's care as well as taking care of yourself. Here are some ways you can care for yourself and your baby in the NICU. What happens when my baby is moved to the NICU? When arriving on the NICU, your first contact will be with your baby's nurse. They are there to care for your baby, support you as parents, and help you navigate this new journey. Along with helping orientate you in the unit so you know where everything is, 
they will introduce you to the clinical team. Amongst them are social workers who are there to support you with everything from life on the unit to seeking extra financial support and parental leave from work. How can I seek support in the NICU? So the video has six minutes. It's a beautiful video. Thank you so much, Charlene, for uh, doing the voiceover and for the several reviews on the script, the cultural adaptation, the beautiful uh, graphics that we have representing different communities across Canada. So my question would be for Candice first. Candice, do you think a video like that, because I know you've seen the video before, can be helpful for families experiencing the NICU? You're mute, Candice. Sorry. <laughs> Let's unmute you. Okay, yeah. perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that video is really awesome. I think it, it is really helpful and it would be really helpful for like any families, not just Indigenous families. Like, uh, I think it's like, um, it's important um, that like new uh, parents, like their premature babies, to feel heard and to feel guided through that that experience and that journey when I had my um, my stay at the Grey Nuns Hospital in um, Edmonton with my son. That was something that I liked and I, I did feel really supported when I when we had our stay there. Like I, they told me like like how it is in the, the video like she the nurses that um, helped with my son showed me where everything was and I was always like offered the opportunities to like help in care, caring with my son. Charlene, any comments on the on this video? Uh, because this is just one first initiative that we created, but I feel there's so much more that we can work on together. And I'm I'm hoping Candice and you, Charlene, will be part of our new initiatives, bringing more information for families. What is your take on it? Oh, I'm super excited for families to have access to resources like this. Like, um, people are stressed when they go into the hospital. So uh, this would give them the opportunity to consider, like, if they did have any um, wishes for cultural support, because they're probably stressed out about other things that they don't, um, they don't really think about their needs. So... I think it's an it's an awesome way to remind people that yes they do need support and there are resources out there and it would help give them like um what Candice was talking about the opportunity to to advocate for themselves absolutely Candice one last comment before you wrap it up that you'd like to share with healthcare professionals watching us here today um Probably just um, <laughs> just to keep like for like everybody to keep working like towards like uh, supporting indigenous families like in the hospitals. Um, like we do need more cultural practices around pregnancy and babies being born. Absolutely. Rachel, some last thoughts from you. I'm sharing again your website and all the amazing resources that you have there in the trainings. Yeah, we're just so happy to have our, our little part in, in supporting the great work that's happening on the ground, uh, such as you've, you've heard from Candice and Charlene today. Uh, the resources uh, are um, like originally, you know, created by the early years, but they've been adapted in ways that we never could have imagined um, by each community um, in that way that's specific for them. So this video is a, a culmination of, of, you know, a lot of different input coming together. And I think we can only improve it and create more um, and make them accessible. And we want to be just part of making sure that that access is, is able to be had and that we are increasing awareness as much as possible. So hopefully we'll continue to do this through, through working with all of you. Absolutely. And Charlene, some last thoughts before you wrap it up? 
Yeah, I too, I really appreciate everybody who has logged in today. That in itself shows that you guys are willing to um, start those partnerships and just remember to include um, Indigenous people in every step of the way, all the way from the planning, all the way to through to the delivery and the evaluation of every single um, initiative that is done to help improve Indigenous um, health outcomes. And uh, yeah, that's that's all for today. So thank you for having me. And I look forward to working with all of you more in the future. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Rachel. I am so happy that we wrap up our year of Premi Chats with this particular chat. It's been on CPBF's planning for many years to create something with Indigenous communities. And I'm happy that we took the first step and we were able to launch just before uh, the year ends. But I'm very grateful uh, to all of you for taking the time to sharing your stories, your passion, your work with us here today. We have so much work to do, so much learning uh, ahead of us, but I'm, I think we CPBF is very uh, honored to have taken the first step with all of you today. So thank you for being here. And I hope uh, Charlene and Candice will be back with CPBF next year because now I'm excited to continue uh, working and develop more uh, materials. And Rachel, we, we still have uh, plans for, for mm -hmm. moving forward for 2023. Yes, certainly we do. So thank you, everyone. Um, and for all of you watching us live here today, uh, the video of today's session and all the videos from our live series are available on our website, which is right here. Let me share the Canadian uh, premise.org. And as 2022 comes to an end, we want to take a moment to express our gratitude to our community of parents, healthcare providers, teachers, teachers, researchers, supporters, and sponsors. Although we have accomplished much this year, we are listening and have more planned for the future. The return to more in-person events and connections has strengthened us, and we continue to push forward for more. I want to thank uh, a special thanks to our uh, committee teams uh, of volunteers and consultants who bring this Premi Chat live every Friday. Special thanks to Patricia, Barbara, Felipe, and Camila, and my co-host, Leah. And I also a uh, huge thanks to our presenting sponsor, AstraZeneca, for supporting our vision and continue to support our education sessions. We end this year celebrating the live session number 200. We delivered 200 live sessions since the beginning of the pandemic in March 2022. And with 2023 on the horizon, the Premi Chat will come back with a new brand, new co-hosts, and all, as always, amazing speakers. And before I wrap it up, I want to acknowledge the strength of the NICU parents and the resilience of our small but mighty babies. They inspire us and we, co we commit to continue to work together and stand strong for families facing preterm birth. And on behalf of all of us here at CPBF, happy holidays and a prosperous and healthy 2023. Stay well, everyone. I see you in 2023.